Well, I'm told it's 15 seconds. So hopefully coaches, you are seeing me now. Um, I am Dr. Jen Welter and I am so, so, so honored to be here with all of you. Um, thank you Huddle for bringing us all into your huddle and allowing us to connect digitally while we are um, at, at different places in the world and different spaces. I wanna bring you through my eyes into my heart. Um, I fell in love with football early, just like a lot of you probably did. And yet when I looked out on the field, probably like a lot of you, I looked out and I thought, these guys look like real life superheroes. And these are the brightest lights I'd ever seen. And I just wanted to be one. Simply, I just wanted to play the game. And it was also the first place in this world that somebody told me that there was a difference between what girls could do and what boys could do. So though I loved the game, I, I loved it from afar until I finally got the opportunity to play for my first football team at 22 years old. Thankfully, I had played rugby first, so I was already, already a, a good tackler when I got there. But I think so many times, right? I was blessed with an amazing career to meet and play with the best women and men all across the world. And yet, as far as I've gone in football, yes, being able to become the first female coach in the NFL because of a champion like Bruce Arians and a forward-thinking um, organization like the Arizona Cardinals. One thing that I always wondered is, you know, if I would have started earlier, just how good could I have been? If I would have seen somebody doing what I wanted to do, just how far could I have gone? If I didn't have to love the game from afar and not get to play, where would I be now? And so I believe that being a first it's an opportunity and responsibility to ensure you're not the last. And I believe that girls and women deserve the opportunity to play and fall in love with this game, just like the guys. And I think if you love the game of football as much as I do, which I know you do, then you're gonna see the game in a different way. But a lot of people hadn't had the opportunity to see girls and women like I have. And that's why I've been committed to growing the game by getting women and girls on the field and in the game to help them love the game that we all love so much. So I'm going to be very visual with you in the beginning because some people have never seen it. And I'm going to show you through my eyes and my heart kind of this journey to ensure that the next generation of football players knows that they can go as high as they want and that you the generation of coaches that are here now in this game all can play a part. So if you'll join me really quickly, sit back. I, I have a couple of videos for you that I think, I think will speak to your heart and the love of the game. So thank you so much coaches for your attention. Here we go. What we'll say is simply break down and y'all will say, ha, so break down. Now, why is this important? I hope that I have some girl dads out there. Um, and even if I don't, I know you have a sister, mom. Sports changed my life, specifically the sport of football. Sport of football taught me I could be magic. At five foot two, I could go out there and feel like I was six foot 10, that I could tackle the world. And I worked on this campaign for the Keep Playing Like a Girl campaign and actually authored part of the literature. And this changed my life. This information, this slide right here is responsible for the birth of the idea of Gridiron Girls. 
approximately half of girls quit sport around puberty. And yet 18 to 24 year old women, when you ask them who played sports regularly were twice as likely to identify as confident as girls who did not play sports. So we're talking not just about the importance of playing, but the impact that that confidence will have in everything that they do. And for those of you who have found football at that, as that place in that space, I hope you'll understand why it can be that space for girls and women too. Now, the reasons that they gave that they quit sports, seven out of 10 girls felt they didn't belong in sports, feel that society does not encourage them to play sports and say there aren't enough visible female role models in sports today. It really is important that we show them and tell them and create opportunities for them and support and highlight them so that for every reason that we say, guy, you know, sports change guys' lives, that they change girls' lives too. And it was real to me. This is real, really important. I started playing football 15 years ago and I fell in love. Oh, got a free defender coming straight in from the outside. Jen does a great job when she's blitzing, one of the hardest hitting uh, football players I've ever seen. But I didn't start playing football to be here. I didn't even dream that it was possible. And I think the beauty of this is that though it's a dream I never could have had, now it's a dream other girls can grow up and have. And I show that clip. I started playing. I'm sorry. I show that clip to y'all because. I did not accept my first coaching job that I was offered. Wendell Davis, former Dallas Cowboys, saw how I was with the Texas Revolution after that when I had played on it. And he said, you have to coach my football team because I impressed him as a baller, as somebody who was around the game. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Women don't, women don't do that. And he said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. And in fact, when I turned him down, he took the job on my behalf and then told me about it. Coaches, I know you change a lot of lives. You have the opportunity to change even more by helping girls and women to see themselves in places and spaces that they have not yet seen. I don't know if you know this or not, but they still refer to football as the final frontier for women in sports. And I say it's it's finally here, but I don't want you to hear that just from me. I want you to hear from some of the gridiron girls who inspire me every day. Boys think that girls are not able to do what they do. Makes me feel angry because I can do whatever they can. They should know that girls can do it uh, better than the boys can. <laughs> I think the boys that told the girl that she shouldn't play football was an idiot. They say I'm a girl, I'll never be as good as them. And then I say, then why have I scored against you? I want every one of these girls to know that there is no game that they cannot play and no field that they do not belong on. The game is the game. It's not, it's, it's not going to stop this from, from me and for women. It's for whoever can play or wants to play. Girls can play football if they try hard enough. They can be just as good as boys or even better. Now, a lot of people say we have co -ed. I was the only oops sorry now a lot of people say we have co-ed as an option and that is absolutely priceless and valuable but i want you to think about it also as is it should it be co-ed or should it be versus the girls and i think that the girls say it best through their experiences it's not one size fits all oops if I can play it, here we go. I was the only girl, and they never and they never passed the ball to me. I was like always just like on. I was always just like in the play, but I wasn't like I was just like running out, and I didn't do anything, and that just hurt me a lot, I guess. And you know what? 
you were wide open once. Yes. And no. you could catch, can't you? Yes, I can catch. Like, you know who lost? Who? They lost. Yeah, because no, because the people on the defense just never covered me because I wasn't getting past to her. Are you still playing now? Yeah, I'm on an all-girls team with Annabelle and Emma, who I don't know where she is. Football can look good. It doesn't have to look like um, these girls don't belong. And I think for me, that was something we had to change. When I did my first uh, girls camp, when I came up with this crazy idea of Gridiron Girls, I just want y'all to know I couldn't find any sponsors. I did it on my own, self-funded it. And I announced that I was gonna do a national tour with no sponsors, no backing, and just thankfully some great people who believe in me and will ride with me. And I was going to do my first poster and I couldn't find any pictures of girls playing flag. It was so striking to me. I couldn't, couldn't find something that I could use. And so I actually had to have um, a cartoonist draw me a picture of girls playing flag so that I could get a foundation to be able to build from. And one of the things I realized is the perception wasn't matching with the reality. And we needed to make football fierce. We may need to make it look cool. We needed the swag to be there for the girls, just like it is for the boys. And that's something I think, if there's one thing I take pride in, it's really showing the girls as they are and they can be and making it a place where they want to be. Football is important. Sports can teach you a lot. The one gift I would give you over anything else is go after what you want in this world. We don't just move the chains, we break them. <laughs> we as coaches and football people are so used to marking progress 10 yards at a time, moving the chains, moving the chains. And I was saying that to somebody one day and I was like, am I moving the chains in a game that wasn't created for me? in one that didn't have a place for me, one that didn't look like me, one that didn't allow me to be there and to win. And I realized that we can't be chained by old ideals. We can't look at the field or the game and, and play it the way it's always been played with the players who have always been playing it. We have to look at it through a new lens. And that's what break the chains mean, just because the past was this way, does not mean the future is defined by it. And football suffers from sins of omission. Right? I worked with Madden um, a couple of years ago. And one of the changes they made was they actually put me in Madden as the first female head coach. And it's interesting that in a 20 year game, that was the first time that they'd had a female as a coach. And yet, to me, it was so important because we may not be at that place in that space in the real world where we have a female head coach and say the NFL, but guess what? Through virtual spaces and places, we can reinforce what a coach looks like and that creates a new normal. It lets guys see it and it be more normal and girls aspire to be it. These changes are in everything that we do. So when we think about what the game looks like, Let's, let's open that view up so that she can see it, she can be it, he can see it, he can be it. And guess what? We can be it together. This is a great game. Full contact chess. That's what I call football. And it is a sport that literally is founded on diversity, right? It fundamentally does not work if we all look the same. Can you imagine any one player prototype, right? If you had them 11 times over on that field, you lose, right? Buccaneers went in big time to get Tom Brady, TB12, the one. But can you imagine if that team had 
11 Tom Brady's on the field at one time, coach, your game plan would be a little off, right? So why aren't we more proactive in terms of the places and spaces that we can create for girls and women? Let's show that girls in football are not the ex exceptions to the rule. The rules are changing. And for coaches and for all of us involved, that means we need to highlight, celebrate, and coach them. There is no job for showing up while female. They want to play the game. I always tell this to, to the girls. Let's coach them up. Let's let them be great. Let's let them experience an end zone dance made after a one-handed catch in the end zone. That's what they want. And I think we all want that for them. Or at least I know I do. And I tell you, there has never been a better time for girls in women. Because the future is now. There is sanctioned high school female flag football in Florida, D.C., Georgia, Alaska, New York, New Jersey's coming. I, I, the world games are going to be in Alabama in 2022, right? And they're going to have both girls and guys flag football. Sorry, men's and women's flag football, which means the Olympics are going to come, y'all. So this game and where it's going means if we want it to grow and have explosive growth, it's time for the women. Because by the way, for the first time in the history of the game, the NAIA is running its first varsity sanctioned flag football season, which means there's scholarship opportunities there and coming. And for the first time, girls, and women, right, they'll grow into women, can change the trajectory of their lives by playing the game of football. Football has changed many a family. And now girls and women are going to be able to change their families' lives and their educational trajectory through football as well. And we look good doing it, too. <laughs> I'm going to restart that real quick because I don't know why it looked um, bad and it's one of my favorites. Um, so hold up with me one, one, one minute. And that girl right there, by the way, her name is Jada. She is the quarterback for St. Thomas University. And when we did this camp, that was not possible. And I went and saw Jada play and one of her coaches said, it changed her life that day. She decided that's what I wanna do. And now she is a college quarterback. So every time I see that face, it lets me know that we're doing something right. going to get that video today. It's not looking like it wants to load properly. Um, but the good news is I can always get it to you guys later. Um, it is one of my favorites, but it doesn't want to cooperate. So I'm going to be coachable and I hope you all will be coachable with me. Um, and I am going to take off the screen share now and hopefully we can um, have some questions. Do we have some questions, anybody? Your screen, if it fails again. Okay. Um, I can try that. Let's see.
Guys, are we still are we still working? One question so far. Okay. Um, there we go. After coaching the Detroit demolition for all nine years, they were around. I found the only difference in coaching men and women is that women generally want to know the why <laughs> that they're asked for on the field. Oh man, you are absolutely positively very correct in terms of the why. Um, I appreciate you chiming in on that coach. Um, what I will say is that, um, you know, it's a powerful why, and we haven't always had the same, um, <laughs> I, okay, I'm going to back up on that. So it's full contact chess. The reason I say it's full contact chess is because I always wanted to know what the chess pieces were and how they fit together. Right. So women want to know the whole picture so they understand their part of the picture. And I think sometimes that is especially for the women who have come in later to the game of football like I did. Right. We weren't socialized the same way as kids. So it was just you just do it or you've gotten to see and experience all of that. So for me, even as a player, I wanted to understand the why. So I would know also what the contingency was. So, yes, absolutely. Give them the why. I always think the why is good there for the guys, too. Um, it helps. But sometimes it's um, it's the fluidity. Um, OK, great question. Here we go. How do we empower other women to push the issue? My concern is as this sport grows, the coaching will be uh, will be by males, leaving out valuable women to young women mentoring and teaching and leadership. Um, thank you, MD. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you'll notice if you look at the NAI coaching staffs, you have both men and women. Um, a, one of my former teammates, Angelica Grayson, is one of the head coaches. Um, there's also Liz Sowers, who's one of the coaches. And these are all former women's players, right? And I use those as, as an example because though it's not definitely not publicized to the same extent, there's women's tackle football at the highest level. Um, and people like me come through that system. There's the WNFC, there's the WFA. These women are there and playing. Um, and what we need to do is make sure that there are bridges interconnecting so that those women are getting opportunities to coach and to see that they could coach and to connect with the guys in coaching. Um, one of the things that we've done with like the Gridiron Girls program is um, I wanted to be intentional about those connections. So with my camps, I always say the girls get to learn from both the best women and men in the game. So we generally have, you know, we have Anthony Stone, um, who was my one of my favorite coaches I got to play for. He was my U.S. national team coach. Um, he runs Coach Stone Football, and he's, you know, kind of my um, my partner in crime. So they get the women and men. We have a lot of former and current NFL players who love to do the camps. And then we partner with a local women's team, right, whether it be WNFC, WFA, um, and the WF. Uh, the WNFC and WFA have a talent pool that y'all need to look at and pull from because these are the women that are in love with the game to the point that they would do like I did and play the game literally for a dollar a game. All right. When I, that was the first check I got, even as a pro. So you have women who are sacrificing so much with the passion to stay and play in this game that they'll coach, right? But we have to actually make it something that they feel approachable, that they feel connected to, um, and that those teams um, are there so that we have the women and we work with them, right? Mentorship is really important in coaching and there's not the same level of interconnectivity um, so that the women will know, again, for me, it took me playing on the men's team to develop the relationships with those guys that I felt the opportunity to, or actually was, was given the opportunity. It's so much different when you're on the field with somebody. I mean, I challenge you all right now to think of if you were building your staff today, where would you pull from? Probably the people you played with, right? 
I mean, it's not, you know, the guys in the locker room who um, you wanted to be around, who were, you know, coaches, leaders, and you could tap somebody or somebody could call you for a reference. Hey, do I know a guy? Well, (laughs) there are no guys that happen to be females too. And yet, if we haven't had an opportunity to be on the same field, that's harder, right? We didn't get the natural time or even have the teams be in similar situations. I look at People ask me all the time about, you know, basketball and the progress that the number of coaches in the NBA has seen. But that's an easier transition because there's more natural um, synergy, right? You have a, you know, you have a collegiate women's team that practices and plays in similar times as a collegiate men's team. So they get to know each other through the game. And so we have to be intentional about not only getting the girls the opportunities to play, but also building bridges with the women who are in the game, who love it and who would want to coach. And oh, by the way, um, if you have great coaches, you already know we can, we can teach them how to be um, great football coaches as well. So you probably have more talent that just hasn't necessarily been as curated, but can be. Um, it just may take you going out of a little bit of little bit past your comfort zone, coaches. Um, but talent is talent, and you know if you can evaluate talent, you can find it. Um, let's see. Here we go. Do you have advice for female coaches that want to make a living from football? Absolutely. Um, and the first thing is to treat it like a profession. Um, you know, it, it's not. It's not necessarily easy to do that, but all of the things that, you know, the guys have done to make it a profession, those, that's a lot of the same things, right? So what would you do to be a great coach? Um, I mean, I, I'll be straight up honest. My first coaching job, I made $75 a week and it was not easy. In fact, it was really hard, but it was also priceless experience. And it was an opportunity to network and to get good and to, you know, coaching staffs, um, particularly like they move together and you have to, you have to not only know of someone, but to know them a lot of the time. And so volunteer, um, work camps, get connections and the more you can integrate and really get to know good football people, the more you'll have opportunities to expand your game. Um, and, and I mean, that's really, that's really what it is and work on your craft. Again, it's, it's not enough just to show up and say, I want to do it. Like when you're around people, how do you communicate? What do you communicate? My path to get to where I was, right. I, you know, had a great reputation as a player, right? A great playing career. But as I was getting that experience, I also got a master's degree in sports psychology, right? Because there wasn't a path for a woman in coaching at that time, it wasn't my goal, right? So it wasn't like, this is the goal and this is how we work backwards. For me, it was, I'm going to be in football. I love this game. And how can I become a unique value proposition to the sport? So got my master's in sports psychology. From my master's in sports psychology, that then triggered that um, I was was actually helping guys get ready for the draft, for the combine. And when they were getting ready, what I realized is I'd never gone through the combine. And I'd never been on the evaluation end of a player. So how was I going to tell these guys and help them with that process if I didn't know what that process was? So I went to sports management worldwide and took a football scouting and general management course there. Not that I wanted to necessarily scout because again, that was something I had never thought was a possibility for me, but I did want to understand how players were scouted. I wanted to know how to write a scouting report so that I could advise the players. So here I got experience on breaking down tape and, you know, starting to look through the eyes of a scout, right? Then I ended up going back to school and getting my PhD um, and 
funny enough, my business before I ever got into coaching was actually coaching coaches on coach athlete relationship and feedback and, you know, team building and organizational and leadership and um, sports psychology things. So I was doing a lot of the things um, to help the coaches and to help the players and to help the team. I just never had made the mental shift that it could actually be a football coach. Um, So the more you can do, again, to be a unique value proposition to the sport, take what's different about you and your journey and your expertise and make it viable. And another great example, though, she's on the basketball side, it's like Brittany Donaldson. Um, I love Brittany. I met her at a panel in Toronto. And the way she ended up getting um, onto the coaching staff was she was a former player who had a knack for stats, data analysis. And she got a job um, with the Raptors in the front office. And she was so good with, um, with the data analysis and useful to the coaches that they ended up you know, basically making her a coach doing the same thing, right? So the door to her career was opened through her talents and being able to, again, be unique and special to that coaching staff. I hope that makes sense. Um, Let's see. Um, I am a commissioner of a youth football program in Mass. I will be proposing to our board that we launch a girls flag program Any suggestions on how to get started, restrictions, um, sponsors, acceptance by community? Um, There are some great, great resources in mass on Flag Ron. I am happy to point you to some of them. Um, And also, please be aware, um, in terms of resources, if you are a high school football coach right now, realize that Nike and the NFL just pledged $5 million to help establish girls flag football programs in high schools. Okay. It is massively expanding. There are several States coming on. um, And that money is there to help start programs. So need to tap into that for sure. Um, There are also some very cool resources and people. So if, if anybody wants to reach out to me, however, I can help you in that. I absolutely will. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, Hi, Andy. Um, Andy's question, as a flag coach in the UK, what is one thing you could do or say to recruit females from other more traditional sports? Um, You know, the thing I would say is give them an opportunity to, to fall in love with it, right? One of the things that, the reason we started Gridiron Girls is I found that Co-ed situations were tough. Even if a camp was co-ed, they were traditionally, and and this is not a stat I could pull, but me having gone to the camps, if the camp was about 200, you would see two, three, maybe four girls. That means one to 2% are girls. So why is it intimidating to make that leap? Well, if girls aren't being socialized the same way as the boys, if they're not being taught, you know, the diamonds and how to throw a ball properly, then if, even if they step into that situation, they're at a fundamental disadvantage, right? And then what happens? Oh, you throw like a girl. Hey coach, I'm gonna ask you, anybody know what throwing like a girl looks like? Cause I, I think that it's either you throw a football properly or you don't. And then even then Mahomes doesn't throw a football properly. He's just an exceptional athlete, right? Mahomes has rewritten what throwing a football looks like. So can we teach them in an environment where they get a great football experience and they get to have fun with it and then they want more of it, right? I want, I always say gridiron girls is confidence through football right? Teaching the girls, there is no game they cannot play and no field they do not belong in or on. So let's teach them the skills. Let's teach them how to do all this stuff. So if there's street ball going on, they want to play and they know that they're not going to be made fun of because they're fundamentally behind. And then a lot of the times when you give them the opportunity to close that gap, then they'll go into co-ed situations. But I think really making sure they have a solid grasp on the fundamentals so that they can go into any situation and feel confident that's one of the really magic keys that we've done with Gridiron Girls. Um, Dennis says, in addition to promoting girls playing, what suggestions would you have to, um, to convert the traditional role of high school team manager into something more similar to a grad assistant coaching mentorship, something to get them involved in the game at a greater level? You know, Dennis, I think that's a great idea. 
right? I think that that is a phenomenal way to look at the places and spaces that we can use um, an existing role and have it be a position for growth, right? Like, can, you know, can we teach somebody who has a great hunger, great energy, great to be around to take on additional responsibilities? And I would say yes. And I would say that is absolutely possible. And, you know, find those people that you want to build into and grow and let them literally step up to the challenge, right? But be a mentor because remember, it's going to take intentional, you know, somebody intentional. I think if I had to say one thing that has been the absolute hardest, scariest part for me in all of this is that I didn't have somebody guiding me, right? We talk about mentors. I, I, I didn't have somebody who I could look at and ask all those questions to or go to or teach me how to network or, you know, socialize me to know these are the guys that, you know, can help you. And I, I hope I've done a decent job at times, but when there's no pathway, it means not everything you do is going to be right. And it's certainly not fluid, not like, you know, going from a grad assistantship to this, to knowing all of these insider programs. Um, so that's been hard, but I say, find those people and then, you know, wrap your, your arm around them and infuse your talent and knowledge into them to really put them in, in a position where, um, where they've got a go-to person. Um, because if I could say the things that I have struggled with the most in my career, it's that. Um, Eddie, as a high school coach, when I see a girl come on a team, I spend just as much time, teach them the same skills and give them the same opportunities. Most girls sadly leave the team or don't come back for a second season. What can I do to connect and set them up for success? Um, you know, Eddie, it sounds like you're doing you're doing great things and making sure that they have the same coaching. Just remember, they may have not had the same backdrop, right? So they may actually need a little more coaching. And it's hard to be one. It is hard to be the one of one because that means you are the only. So from a social perspective, it may be harder than just a football perspective, Um you know, I know when I played on the men's team, I had to dress with the dance team. So I walked into a locker room. The world is waiting to see what's going to happen when I play football against men, right? And, you know, I, I live action, like getting up after getting tackled from these guys and I walk into a locker room and they're literally glittering each other. Okay, that's, that's tough. Because then you have layers on top of layers on top of layers. So where do you go that you have your tribe? And it's really, I would say that if they don't come up or they don't come back or they quit, it may not be just the, the actual football. It may be some of the social implications too. So make sure that they feel supported and heard and um, kind of be intentional about allowing them to talk to you about how they feel, what's going on in, in a football sense and in a human sense, right? Um, Cause it's not easy. It, it is really, really tough to be the one of one. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Julie, uh, Julie Hol Hollerbaum. Sorry, I probably brutalized your name and I apologize for that. Thank you for your presentation. How do you evaluate the chances to find an opportunity to coach or play in the States as a female coach and player from overseas? Um, Julie, I, um, first of all, thank you for that question. I don't think, um, I, I probably should have done a better job actually is a better way to say it, of expanding on and letting people know how much hunger there is overseas for the game of football, uh, both flag and tackle. Um, I had the opportunity to be the head coach of the first Australian women's national team. And the passion over there is off the charts. And one of the things that we learned is that a lot of the coaches, you know, that coaching resources overseas were tough to come by. And that a lot of the coaches were, you know, teaching themselves off of YouTube. So I'm not sure necessarily how to tell you how to evaluate, um, 
opportunities to coach and play. But what I would say is reach out and connect, right? Um, connect with the, the leagues and connect with opportunities to coach and ask questions. Um, and AFCA, um, AFCA is a tremendous resource. So if you're, if you haven't checked out American football coaches association, definitely do that. Um, but you really want to start getting into a network and talking to the people that talk football, who's playing, who's coaching, where are they are, their are opportunities. And there are going to be a lot of opportunities coming up in say like the NAIA for coaching, um, for women's flag. And then the high school opportunities for flag will be opening up as well. Um, Esther, um, for sure. I can relate to all of this and, um, oops, sorry. It went away. Um, you were saying today, and as a female player and coach, it's awesome to see you and the other coaches that are coming tomorrow, having a platform to share your experience and knowledge, truly an inspiration. Thank you for that. You are so very welcome. Um, Julie, what are some subtle ways or mistakes you've seen that male coaches or programs that have the full intention of being inclusive, and empowering women to play or commit that might accidentally hurt the effort um, that some may not be aware of. Um, oh, sorry, that's Justin. Um, um, you know, I think it's being intentional, um, and, and understanding where the girls are, right? Um, like I said, co-ed is, can be a really great experience, but it can also be a negative experience, right? If you're, if you're out there and you're open and you're never being thrown the ball, um, are you really letting a, a girl play if she doesn't have the opportunity to fully engage or play, right? And, and but why is that, right? And if that's the case, then, you know, to me, I'd be talking to my quarterback, like she was wide open, right? And why aren't we throwing to her? Oh, well, she's a girl. Okay, well, guess what? I'm going to have you throw her all of these routes and see what happens. Right. So I think it's really important. And then making sure that the girls have the skill and making sure that the socialization is there. And if you need to do a one-on-one, -on -one, if they say they're not comfortable with something, then do it. Right. But I think, you know, I've had a lot of the times guys ask me things like, um, you know, we have a girl coach, like, what do I do? I'm like, coach her, coach her. Right. But don't be afraid to like have a question and to and ask. Um, I think as coaches, for us to be great, we also have to be coachable. Right. And that means I, I try and let any situation coach me. Um, because how am I going to teach someone if I don't know where they are, um, where they want to go, or how they're going to get to the next level? Right. Like, we, we really have to um, have the ability to um, understand people in order to help them get where they're going. And so if, if a program has struggled, like have girls been able to see that they belong? Is there anybody that looks like them? Have you, you know, have you facilitated a conversation maybe that, you know, allows them to have access to a female coach that they could talk to? Um, and I think that those are all really important things um, because the, the natural tendency is, is not necessarily to have that door be open. And though it may not be fully closed, how hard is it for um, a girl or girls to make that jump, right? Are we actively saying like, hey, you know, um, look at our highlight reels, right? If your school puts out a highlight reel and you have a flag team and a tackle team, um, are you putting out highlights in the same dope fashion for the girls playing as you are for the boys? Generally, it's not the case, right? So we want to make it not just that they're an exception, but they can rule on the football field, right? That you can be that baller too, because she can. And I know all of you have the ability to help facilitate that. And, you know, one of the things that we do with Gridiron Girls, we partner with organizations and go in and help run like a camp to help build that momentum for you, right? So if you bring us in, we're going to give you the sizzle and then you stay with the substance, right? I'm going to be there, help pull people in that may have been intimidated by the game before. And then, you know, you're the ones who are going to run the league or have the teams or some of that, but then it helps jump over that barrier, 
right? And we want to make sure that the girls not only see that they can do it, but they also see the women um, who are doing it at the highest level and that they know there is a trajectory, right? Remember before the NAIA season, it was a matter of either um, you played another sport or played football, right? Like football had no place that you could go, but now you could change your life by playing football, right? You go to college by playing football and we haven't seen that before. So girls need to know where these opportunities are. So it's not like, well, I can't play football because I need to get a college a scholarship and go to college, or I want to go to college, football can now become a vehicle for college. And, and we, as all of the football community need to erase that and make sure that we're telling those stories and sharing them. So the girls have permission to dream, right. And that they can see women who look like them and know that there's a future for them. So I think if I am not mistaken, it's very weird. I have no faces. Um, yes, I have a feeling that that's it. Um, I am so thankful for all of you for giving me the gift of your time. Time is the thing that we have and there never feels like there is enough of it. And I certainly know you are all busy people. And I really thank you for letting me share um, a bit about my journey, who I am, and the game as it will be, which is much more inclusive than it has been in the past. And you all are part of that change. So thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor. Um, and I look forward to changing the game with you. Thank you.